Old powers waken, shadows stir, an age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. The glass candles are burning, and you're listening to the Obsidian Nights Podcast. Welcome back to uh, the Obsidian Nights podcast, where I go through A Song of Ice and Fire chapter by chapter. Today, we are across the narrow sea in Pentos with Daenerys Targaryen as she weds Khal Drogo. And today, I have two special guests, my moderators from the Gray Area Discord server, Tubi and Bright Roar. I'm so excited to do this chapter with y'all. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi guys, we are the Discord server moderators and we are so stoked to be here with Bright. Oh yeah. Great area on our Daenerys chapter two breakdown. Oh yeah. And I, I don't I don't think Tubi I don't think Tubi likes Daenerys, so this is gonna be interesting. Yep. I don't hate her, but she's not my favorite. Long as you don't hate her. <laughs> I don't. I don't hate Long her. as you don't hate her, we we could get through this. <laughs> She's got a couple choice words for her, though. Don't let her lie. All right. Well, it's going to be what it's going to be because I'm going to defend my baby. Daenerys is, I got to protect Daenerys. Daenerys Targaryen wed called Drogo with fear and barbaric splendor in a field beyond the walls of Pentos. For the Dothraki believed that all things of importance in a man's life must be done beneath the open sky. So just to set everything up, Daenerys is just this timid girl she's fearful she's been abused and she's being forced to marry Khal Drogo by her brother Viserys Targaryen in exchange for an army so there's a lot going on in this chapter um there's a lot we need to talk about but I want to talk about the Dothraki culture a little bit because it comes through heavy in this chapter like she's not eating hearts and everything yet but it's it's a part of Daenerys's arc that I feel is really important so George R.R. R. Martin no doubt based the Dothraki on the Mongols 13th century Asia Genghis Khan all of that and Daenerys is, is definitely experiencing some culture shock at her wedding and she does adapt to this later on whereas Viserys just like outright rejects the culture and winds up dying because of it but we are introduced to the culture right before the wedding and at the wedding where Viserys is just like very naive to their ways he thinks he gives them his sister and then they give him an army and it's just like this equal exchange but it does not work that way in the Dothraki culture they do things based off of omens and call Drogo uh, like he plans to wed Daenerys and then give her to the Doge Colleen, like present her to the Doge Colleen. And then if omens favor war, then they go to war. So what were your first thoughts about the Dothraki? For me, the uh, the Dothraki, they, they definitely give off this, uh, you know, very strong pagan vibe where, you know, sex is not shameful. Everything they do is out in the open and they're strong. They're super strong people you know they live in the middle of the of a desert or they race across a desert all the time so when you you know are are given this culture right away it kind of it kind of like makes you take a step back like whoa what is she about to get into and then that's that's how I felt about the Dothraki they scared me well I think it was also the beginning of, of desensitizing her from sex and death because there was so much of it that was so normal. Yeah. It, it, it a good was point. the beginning of her being desensitized. And so she kind of has has got, had this, this feeling like, if I need to fit in here, if I'm going to fit in here, I need to be okay with this. And it was hard for her at first because she, she, she there's a part where she even says she wanted to look away. She couldn't look at it anymore. But mm-hmm. she knew that she had to be strong. She didn't want to upset Viserys she didn't want to upset her new husband because she's terrified of both of them and so she she has that fear as the motivator to be like okay I have to be okay with this Mm -hmm. so for as the reader right 
we just got finished reading like all these chapters in Winterfell. Like we read, a, we we got we had a previous Daenerys chapter, but all these chapters have been in in Winterfell and in Westeros. Um, and then we get this uncivilized, crazy chapter, and wow. it's this little timid girl, this thirteen year old girl, like in the middle of it, and she does have to adjust to that culture because they show the difference like over time they show the difference between her and Viserys like the the Dothraki they despise weakness so she can't be weak so Viserys he's he's weak he 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 doesn't want to accept anything but I do think that yeah, her I don't want to say she's desensitized but yeah, it starts here where she realizes to be a part of something to to lead someone she needs to become them and that's what she does and it starts right here in this chapter so the conversation about call drogo and viserys wanting to sell daenerys to get this army and all daenerys is overhearing that like she's listening to that conversation and imagine overhearing your family talking about selling you yeah. To some horseman <laughs> that you've never met that's huge and terrifying and way older. I can't imagine what that would feel like. Me either. I, like a lot in this chapter, I can't imagine. Right? <laughs> a lot. Like, yay, we're getting chapter. married. People are dying everywhere, but we're getting married. <laughs> yes, definitely. So when she, she overhears like um, Viserys say the dragon doesn't beg. And he's he's the beggar king. Like, that's what people call him. So I found that funny. And Daenerys is like, you know, the dragons are all dead. But then that the night she dreams, she has a dragon dream. And she has a ton of dragon dreams throughout her chapters. But this is the first one. And this one is kind of different than the others. Because in this one, she fears the dragon. Like, she doesn't embrace it. This dream is literally Drogon and Daenerys birthing Drogon and the the dream terrifies her where where later she embraces these dreams and they make her feel better like in in an, another chapter of Daenerys is when she has that dragon dream um with where it's just her and the dragon and Viserys isn't there the, like the night before she has that dream, she wants to die. And then she wakes up like, oh, these dreams are good for me. The dragon means something good for me. But in this dream, she's literally terrified of the dragon. Right. Because the only dragon that she had ever been told I am the dragon was this man that she's terrified of. Yes. Her abuser. But see, I got this serious is. Miriam Asdor vibes from this dream. From the, the, dro- the dragon? Yeah. The- yeah, I see the the thigh blood and kicking her while she's down and ending in crackling fire. That reminded me of getting kicked while she was down, her baby being killed while her husband's dying and the miscarriage with the thigh blood and ending in a crackling fire. Yeah, it's literally it's literally Daenerys All of the events leading up dragons. to that. Yeah, it's crazy. It's literally thing. everything. See, and I, I kind of took it a, a little bit different of a way where in this dream she saw the, the power that came from the dragons. And, and it was, to me, I took it as that she's afraid of her own power. She is afraid to let herself awaken because she might turn into someone like Viserys or like her father. Yeah, I, I didn't really get that vibe, but I kind of see how you could get that vibe because it, it's a scary dream it's a scary dream and then what happens after the dream like for instance when she's alone at the wedding and there's there's no one to talk to her she she doesn't understand their language like she's she's just alone and like um she says that I am Daenerys Stormborn, Princess of Dragonstone. I am blood and seed of Aegon the Car. Like she takes strength from that. So I could see like her being scared about that at the same time. Because in her later chapters, 
it's clear that Daenerys struggles with her dragon identity. Like she, she knows that she has to do horrible things and she doesn't want to do them, but she knows that she has to. And she struggles with it a lot back and forth. Like, yes, yeah, she, she does lock her dragons up in Marine. But also, before that, she used her dragon to kill people. So, you know, it's kind of like a struggle that she has. And I, I think it starts in this chapter where she takes, takes, she fears the dragon in her dream. But she also takes strength from who she is. She takes strength from being the blood of the dragon and from being for from being blood of Aegon the Conqueror she draws strength from that it, it, it becomes a pattern for her right and so the fear would come from knowing what that means yes yeah and and throughout the rest of the chapter it's it's four or five times she says I am blood of the dragon I am blood of the dragon that's her mantra that is that you're right it's where she does she draws strength from that and it's every time that she's alone in a frame but you know power is a scary thing yeah it's for her for Daenerys it is the only thing that she has so the only thing she has right now is who she is she's basically being sold like a slave she she doesn't have any control over this situation the only thing that she has control over is who she is because no one can change that and throughout her chapters like with Quaith Quaith is like you know do you know who you are? The dra the dragons do. Do you? And and she's being constantly reminded that who she is. And and her knowing who she is and her knowing who her father is, she doesn't want to be that. She she doesn't want to be a butcher. She doesn't want to kill innocent people. Like she is not that person. Right. And the only other dragon that she does know is her evil crazy brother. <laughs> Yep, that's who she knows. Crazy ass Viserys. I mean, <laughs> it's sad because if you look at her story, if you just read a Game of Thrones and you just only read Daenerys' chapters straight through, it is a sad, depressing story. 13 year old girl sold off to a horse lord. Her brother is killed. Like, all of her family is dead. The person that she considers as her most confident advisor the person that knows all her secrets is selling her secrets her child is killed um her husband is killed she, she it's a sad story but she winds up somehow birthing dragons so it, it her story is sad and george like published all those chapters as a short no a novella in a sci-fi magazine a sci-fi magazine of all magazines um and it's called blood of the dragon <laughs> it would be a very sad little story to read well they he must have did that like back in the day huh yeah like in 96 yeah but she definitely you know she definitely draws strength from who she is so um, more of the dothraki culture gets put on display <laughs> <laughs> like they fight kill and fuck like display. that's the, that's their whole culture fight kill fuck braid hair put bells in hair um so Illyrio says like that a dothraki they basically have sex like animals in their herds they don't know shame or anything like that there's no privacy and i just can't imagine being 13 and like on your wedding day this is like what you're seeing men fighting and mounting women and killing each other in broad daylight middle of a damn wedding it gives you a little bit of sense of what the rest of the weddings are going to be like <laughs> definitely <laughs> a dothraki wedding with at least three deaths is considered a doll affair and so it does like that's a good point it is foreshadowing for how the rest of the weddings are going to be but i i do think that it's foreshadowing of how daenerys's storyline is going to be particularly violent um her journey is is a lot more violent than maybe John Tyrion. It's probably the most violent. 12 people were killed at her wedding. And she's like, well, my wedding is must going to be expensive. 
especially blessed because 12 people died here. <laughs> She like her storyline is is being shown like this is about to, it's about to get violent up in here because she's with the most violent group of people. Right. And, and we have to we have to accept that Khal Drogo is one of the most violent calls as well. He's never had his hair cut. He's never lost a battle. So he must be good at what he does. Yeah, I'm just sitting here thinking like there isn't another there isn't anybody else as violent as the Dothraki. Like, that just kill people for sport. Mm, no. Yeah, that the, she's she's being introduced to the most violent culture that there is. And it's, just, it's sad because she's terrified. Like, every part of her is terrified. Like, she's, she's watching the sun go down, counting the minutes, like, dreading her future. She's she's going to lose her virginity. She's afraid of what Viserys will do to her. She, she's just afraid. And again, she tells herself, I am blood and seed of Aegon the Conqueror. I don't know. Find something to cling on to when you're in that position. Cause... Yeah, you got you have to hold on to all you have, right? If you lose that, then you, you'll lose yourself. Yeah, and the number of times she says she's alone and afraid in this chapter is like, I think we counted it was like six or seven times. It's through the whole chapter, she's just alone and terrified and just reminding herself of who and what she is. And that's all she has to cling to. A lot of her story is about being alone. Yeah, which is why I can see like, um, I'll just say it while we're here. I don't really like to talk about the show on this podcast, <laughs> but <laughs> I'll just say like, I can see Daenerys totally blaming the fuck out of King's Landing. I just cannot see her doing it after the surrender and just like, oh, fuck it. Let me burn all these people, too. It never made sense to me. No. See, and I've said this over and over is I can see the events following that way, but we don't have we don't have the, the POV. We don't have the in-depth, like the, the inside thoughts to what's going on and what's going through her brain. And even if it does go down exactly the way it does... In season eight, George will make it make sense. He going to have to. She going to have to die and come back like as Lady Stoneheart and then kill the whole city like that. Because I don't <laughs> think <laughs> something. It's, it's like something is going to have to happen. Like she's going to die and be resurrected and like, oh, she's Lady Stoneheart Daenerys now. I, I, like I just the, like the cartoonishly evil villains. I can't see them doing like that. I, I really don't even see Euron doing that just saying um i've won the city now i'm gonna kill everybody now i can't even see that for euron but i don't want to get stuck on the show yeah <laughs> so the wedding gifts <laughs> yeah because yes. then i'm gonna i'm gonna dive into how in the dance of dragons she's all calm and stuff yes. so <laughs> wedding, wedding gifts. gifts. Yes. we had such a good talk about the wedding gifts let's go so the things we noticed about the wedding gifts, of course, is uh, Jora gives her the histories. They're, they're children's stories of Westeros, but it's, it's some connection to who she is. Again, who and what she is. The only thing she has to cling to. And Jora gives her that. And I think that softens her a lot towards Jora right off the bat. And Definitely. She, the she other thing we him. noticed, oh yeah, oh, she's ahead. no, no, you're good, you're fine. The, she is so like, they're just books, like they're the least of of the gifts. He even says it's it's nothing big, it's very humble, but here's here's what I have, it's yours. But she's so excited about these books. Grateful, as just, shit. grateful as fuck. <laughs> yeah, so the grateful great, because the gracious it's, queen. <laughs> Because it, it's that tie that she's that she's never had to her home and where her her heritage is and who who and what she is again. But yeah, it's the red door in a book. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. It's home. the The other thing that we noticed though was the handmaids, the eggs, and the weapons. Threes, 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 all over the place. All came in threes. Three, three is a very important number for Daenerys because if you so like important. look at the House of Undying. Yes. Three mounts must you ride. Three fires must you light. Three yes. betrayals. Three betrayals. You it's a very important number. And then it all comes back to how many heads does the dragon have? Three. Three. 
So the thing that we noticed about the weapons, though, the weapons, she was given a whip and a rock and a dragon bone bow. And those are the three armies that she will take into war. The whip for the Unsullied, the Iraq for the Dothraki, and the dragon bone bow for the dragons. Right off the bat, we're laying the groundwork for the weapons that she would have at her disposal when she finally came to her fruition in her plan. We did, we did some research and there was, uh, there was no sight of, I, I tried to figure out like would the dragon bone bow mean something different? But um, like we looked in for the children of the forest, we looked to see who all handled dragon bone weapons and there was nothing, like no pattern showed up and it blows my mind that it could be something that simple that the dragon bone bow represents the dragons. It's just dragons. <laughs> just dragons. Yeah, so I was looking at it and I was like, I was like a leather whip. Well, she will end up using a whip for Drogon. Like that's how she controls Drogon is with the whip but i think you're probably right those are the three weapons that she has the dothraki the dothraki unsullied and the dragons so george does that shit he gives us the answer way before we even have to ask the question yeah so i don't remember anybody ever making that so you guys are the first person to bring that to my attention the first person i heard it from go us yes yes go (laughs) you discord mods for the win (laughs) so she also gets the dragon eggs and the dragon eggs Illyrio says they're from the shadowlands beyond the shy but i think it's pretty clear that in fire and blood we know though those dragon eggs were stolen from dragonstone by Alyssa Alyssa Mm -hmm. farming's dragons Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. But here was my question to Bright. Now, is Illyrio lying or was he lied to? And if he was lying, is he the one who stole the eggs from the Sea Lord? There's not enough evidence for that. <laughs> There's not enough evidence to answer that question. I will say that he really doesn't have a reason to lie. Really have a reason to lie. Unless, unless he wants Daenerys to, to go to Ashai. Like, Quaith is trying to get her to go to a shy for some reason. So unless he wants to vicariously, like, send her there for some reason. Because Illyrio, like, she, he's not trying to help Daenerys. He's not trying to help Daenerys. He's not trying to help Viserys. He basically thinks that they're going to die. He's, he basically says that out of his own mouth. So if they don't die, they can come to Westeros and start a war and everything. But... He's just setting the stage for Aegon. And, and he doesn't think those dragon eggs are going to hatch. Because if they were going to hatch, if he knew they were going to hatch, he'd have he'd sat on them himself and tried to hatch them. <laughs> Giving them to Aegon. Yeah, them or giving them to Definitely. Aegon. Exactly. Definitely. Because he's not Team Danny at all. And she knows it. Like, that's another thing I'll give her credit for is Daenerys is not dumb she's not dumb she doesn't fall for all that shit like Viserys he he is he falls for the flattery he falls for the bullshit Daenerys kind of sees through it because she's removed from it kind of where they're like usually they're not talking to her she's just listening she's just sitting there listening to everything and taking it in and and she realizes them for what they are bullshit yeah she's definitely better at seeing through people she really is another thing i wanted to talk about when we were talking about the culture that i forgot to talk about is the food like okay Daenerys is like this lady that's used to eating iced fruit and honey duck and all of this good stuff and at her wedding the food is like thick black sausages and Dothraki blood pies so I didn't know what a blood pie was and I looked it up it's a Mongolian dish in real life (laughs) so they're pastries (laughs) stuffed with ground lamb, bone marrow, and congealed blood. pig's blood. No, thank you. Oh, that's gross. <laughs> that's a little much for me. So, like, credit to Daenerys for being able to adapt. Because 
I would have probably starved to death on the right? Dothraki Sea. Like, Not I don't know even what this, joking. With this grass is over here, but I'm just going to go forage with the sheep or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like, seriously. So, her last gift is Drogo gives her the silver horse for the silver of her hair. And it's like a special horse that they want to give Daenerys because she's going to be the Khaleesi. So Daenerys rides the horse and suddenly her fear is gone. She jumps the fire and her fear leaves her. And she tells Drogo like, you have given me the wind. She doesn't know what's come over her. I've got, I've got a, I've got a, something I want to point out for Silver is when she is, when, when, when she's being described, <clears throat> It says, there was something that took, the, that took the breath away. She was gray as a winter sea with a mane of silver smoke. Sea is salt water. So that first thing that jumps out to me is salt and smoke. Which feels to me like another piece of towards Danny is uh, Azora High right there. Definitely some symbol, some symbolism. To, towards Azor High, and there's a lot it, through Daenerys' chapters. Like, I read back through all of her chapters, and I was like, damn, there's so much evidence she's the Azor High. But um, one of my friends, Crow Food's daughter, her channel on YouTube is called The Disputed Lands. She just did an amazing video on the dragon having three heads and Azor High having three heads. Yeah, we love The Disputed Lands. We'll go watch it after this. Um, so going back to, to the, the winter sea and silver smoke, when she goes and she leaps those flames, it is like, to me, that is her awakening. She, she wakes up as with a confidence when she leaps those flames on this horse. So again, that kind of just turns right back around to born amidst salt and smoke. It's just another grain of evidence to show that Danny has an incredible future in this universe. Yeah, she does. I, I agree. Like the, um, but I'm wondering, like, I see the horse as like a symbol and it's definitely one of those things that she sees. She sees that horse in the house of the undying, the, um, her silver trotting to a stream. Like she, she sees that moment, the undying one show her that moment. I'm wondering if she's drawing strength from the horse from the fire or just the thought of herself mount like she doesn't really ride a horse like she says she doesn't really ride a horse she rides palanquins and carts and things like that so she's not used to riding a horse and now she's on on the back of this animal while, while it's not a dragon it's a horse still like it it's it has to feel powerful for someone that's never been in that position and then she jumps over it and it's so special where it the special colorings like I, I definitely feel there's some symbolism going on there she says that it's the first time in her life she didn't she d didn't remember to be afraid definitely some foreshadowing for when she gets on the back of a dragon Viserys slid close to Danny on her silver dug his fingers into her leg and said please him sweet sister or I swear you will see the dragon wake as it never woken before the fear came back to her then with her brother's words. She felt like a child once more, only 13 and all alone, not ready for what was about to happen to her. I see Viserys as just this awful person, right? So when he dies, I don't give one single fuck that he dies. I don't blame Daenerys for not caring that he dies because of, of this right here and the stuff that he's done in the previous chapter and the stuff that he continues to do he's awful person he's disgusting and just to sell off your sister and and give her to a, what's equivalent to i don't know the worst killers on on the face of the planet that westeros and essos is on i think they call it planetos like the the most violent group of people you give it you negotiate this thing with Illyrio to give your sister to them because you want an army but you're not fit to, you're not fit to be a king 
Like, Viserys wants all of this stuff to happen. Like, Viserys wants the Iron Throne. Viserys wants the the Seven Kingdoms and King's Landing and Dragon's Soul. But Daenerys doesn't. She She will later. But right now, in this moment, all she wants is the house with the red door. That's all she wants. That's all she wants in the previous chapter. That's all she wants now. She would. She does not want to be in this situation. She can't control it. She has no control over anything that's going on right now, and she just has to go along with it. Yeah. She she wants to feel safe, and she wants to be happy. Two things that she's she's never had, and she had a, a taste of it, a small taste of it at the house with the red door. But she doesn't have the the lofty aspirations or the 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 yearnings that Viserys does for power. She doesn't have any of that. She just wants to be no, not at all comfortable for the first time in her life. And she's about to be the most uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> that she's going to be in her entire yes. life. So the the last thing I guess we could talk about it, the last thing that happens is this in this chapter is the consummation of her marriage. Yes. With Call Drogo. So it happened very different on the show. But I get, like, I kn- the show gets a lot of shit. They get a lot of shit from everybody. They get a lot of shit from me. But I get why they changed this. Because to the average reader, you you might read what's going on and say, he didn't, he didn't rape her. I think he did. <laughs> I, I She can't. Tell him no. So she tells him no, right? And all he knows is no. So she's not going to give up. Like, he's not going to give up. They have to consummate her marriage. She's been sold to him. She's basically his property now. She has to go along with this. If she doesn't go along with it, Viserys has said, you will see the dragon wake as it has never woken before. So no matter what, there's consequences. Right. She knows if she doesn't go through with this, there's consequences. So I see why they changed it like that. Now, there's like a lot of people that defend Khal Drogo and say, well, Khal Drogo was good to her. Well, he was, but he wasn't always. Like I was saying earlier, before she had that second dragon dream, like she wanted to die. Her life was horrible on the Dothraki. She wanted to die um so i do see why they changed it and they portrayed it that way because to me i felt like it was anyway so i never i've had issues with other shit that wasn't something i had an issue with did you guys um we what we had talked about was the way that drogo treated her people always say like how how gentle and how kind he was and how he just, you know, sat and touched her. And, but how it came across to Wright and I is that he's, like, he was examining, he was examining her. Like he just bought a horse. Like he had just exactly like he had just bought a horse. He was examining his new property. Yeah. I totally get that vibe. I totally get that vibe. And it comes across in the text as, as sweet and gentle, but that's not who and what Drogo is. Right. And you we have to keep in mind, like, when we're reading this, George has set up an unreliable narrator. So we're getting he's being sweet and gentle from a 13-year-old. And the 13-year-old probably does think he's being sweet and gentle when he ju- when she just witnessed 12 people killed at her wedding. <laughs> like, right. yes, compared In to comparison, that. <laughs> yeah, right. So sweet. <laughs> yeah, so compared yeah, to compared that, to yes, that, he's, ooh, being he's so sweet, sweet and gentle. I mean, no, he didn't forcefully, I will say he didn't force himself on her. No, he didn't, it wasn't like it was in the show where he just bent her over and took her. It wasn't like that. But it wasn't physical force. It was psychological coercion. Yeah, it's psychological. She has mm-hmm. to do it. Whether she wants to or not, she has to do it. So, you know, I I just I, I, I don't see it doesn't make a difference to me that they changed that, that part. You wanna yeah, after, after that? we discussed it after we discussed it in our, our preparation for this, I because I had always kind of like because they do it so like violently on the show it felt like such a huge change and i was like oh god why'd they do that ew 
But <laughs> going back and really like diving into the text, I like you said, I, I see how the subtleties of the way he was forcing her would be very difficult to portray on screen. So yeah. it makes sense that they would change it to to convey the the persistence of his coercion in a more physical way. Yeah. It, I don't think like cuz cuz they add rape a lot when it's not yes there. Like it's, they they do that. There. I don't know why I don't know why they do that. Like they did that with the Cersei and Jamie scene. They said they didn't mean to do that, but they did. Um and George like had to come out and talk about that but if you were to convey exactly what happened in the book on the tv screen where you don't have any of that dialogue like inner the monologue you don't have any of that and you might not understand that she's being forced into this and like i think like her whole relationship with drogo 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 <laughs> I think her whole relationship <laughs> I think her relationship with the Drogo is like borderline Stockholm syndrome where like she oh, just good time. she just loves she's just in love with her abuser and I I do think that he comes to love her and she loves him but like where it starts at like let's not really portray this as like the best relationship in all of westeros because in essos and a game of thrones and a song of ice and fire because i don't think it's healthy to portray it like that right and she she comes to love him because she doesn't have another choice she's yeah. stuck in the middle of the grass sea surrounded by all of his people his blood riders what is what's she supposed to do <laughs> the, like, he's all she has and like her her desperation like when he gets sick her desperation to save him where she loses her child and ends up doing blood magic and all of this other stuff like that desperation is beaten it's because she loves him, but it's more out of if he dies, what will happen to me like if he dies what will happen because George like they're gonna cut your baby out they're gonna kill you if he dies we need to go and she's like I'm I, I gotta oh, say my gosh we breezed over a whole section that I wanted to talk about um before the consummation happens the when Drogo is taking out his hair yes the bells the bells mm -hmm. when Drogo is taking out his braid and undoing all of his bells and she comes over and helps him do you think mm -hmm. that taking out his braid and taking out his bells was her undoing his his being of being call, taking his bells away, taking away all of his um, all of his victories because she's the one that essentially gets him killed. That she's mm, taking that's away some spicy. his bells. She's that's undoing some doing his braid. That's some spicy foreshadowing. <laughs> This right? is, I, I will say that <laughs> called Drogo, he got himself killed. Well, no. I, so no. I had this, I have this thing, he right? He got himself injured, but Mary Mazdor is the one that poisoned him. And she only did that because Danny made her. I don't think she poisoned him. I think she, she would have healed him. I did this whole thing with where I went over this with Aziz because I was reading back on Mary Mazdor because she's kind of a sympathetic character to me. She told him, Mary Mazdor, do not drink. Do not remove this. Everything she told him to do, he did the fucking opposite. So if whatever she was going to do was going to work, he didn't listen to her. That's true. It wouldn't have worked anyway because he, yeah. He, yeah, he didn't listen. Anyway. He yeah. straight up ignored everything she said. Like, she was like, don't drink any alcohol. Like, he had ripped it off and got some Dothraki healer to put something on it. And I really think, like, he just got an infection. Now, the blood magic part and the shit that she did to Daenerys as far as in, like, telling her it's going to be this horse that you're going to sacrifice and I'm going to bring him back. And then he comes, it's her actually her baby, and he comes back as a vegetable. Like, that's all Mary Mazdor's doing. But at, when I first, when I went back and read that for the Mary Mazdor 
thing I did with Aziz, I was like, bro, he ignored everything she told him to do. And he basically said it like, I don't listen to you, woman, like go to hell. Now, did she know that he was going to ignore her? Probably. Probably, yeah. She probably knew. But we 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 don't know if she poisoned him because he didn't he didn't follow any of his instructions. <laughs> like if you go to your doctor and your doctor gives you penicillin and says, take this penicillin for 12 days and you take it for six and then start drinking alcohol when it says don't drink with alcohol and then you get sicker. Is it the person that gave you the penicillin's fault or is it your fault because you didn't follow oh. the directions? definitely the patient <laughs> too true yeah that's all the patient but too i do true. like the idea of her taking out his braid and his victories and and i like that because when when he dies daenerys takes on a part of him like daenerys never a she never fully abandons the dothraki way like right. that's a part of her now i like that she takes strength like she never right, she gives it. up she, she owns who she is she never gives up and she's always wondering if she's doing it right like she wants to do the right thing and i think that's that's important that she wants to do the right thing almost all the yeah. time she's one of the more self-aware characters yeah she is and she's one of the most empathetic characters in the entire series so that's basically Daenerys too. <laughs> that it's it's her wedding. There's like the foreshadowing with the gifts. The um, we I think we need to look deeper into the threes. All the threes that come up in her story. I need to go back and um, do some digging on that because threes come up all the time in her story, and the dragon all has the three heads. But yeah, she's she's this, a 13 year old girl in a very bad situation and she's alone and she takes strength from her identity and who she is. And that'll be a thing constantly as we go forward. Basically, uh, weddings and yeah, weddings on the planet of uh, the world of ice and fire suck. <laughs> Better be careful. 100%. 100%. It's a lot of weddings coming up that are going to suck. And this is the first one. Twelve the first of dead. Men. Twelve yeah. dead at this wedding. Twelve dead. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to thank you guys for coming on here. and Oh, thank you um, for having us. Oh, no problem. Yes. You guys hold the Discord down. Anybody listening, if you want to, they have a book club over on the Discord. Um, you can go and check that out. You don't need anything. So... Yeah, so basically, uh, we do two chapters uh, every week. Um, Mondays are A Song of Ice and Fire, the main series, and we are almost done with the Game of Thrones. And Thursdays are the universe expansion side of it, and we're currently halfway through Dunkin' Egg. And we um, j actually j are just starting, this coming Friday, a, uh, a new book club for Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. So uh, we figured... We'd uh, add a little bit of content from the inspiration for Game of Th for a Song of Ice and Fire. So that's what's going on over in the Gray Area Book Club. All right, guys. So check out the Discord. I will be catching all of you guys next week with Eddard, uh, with Justin Thomas from Top Shelf Fandom. As always, thanks for listening and have a good day.